everyone. I was told it's time to begin. Uh, so uh, let's begin then. My name is Piotr Przewu. I'm remote freelance software gardener. And my job, just as yours, is to sit and look at the source code. Today, we're going to take a look at Grylog, one tool to log them all. But before we do that, we're after lunch, so it's perfect time for dreaming. Uh, close your eyes and dream for a moment that this is a perfect world. In a perfect world, perfect product owners have perfect requirements for their features, so we can deliver perfect uh, systems covered by perfect, nice Uncle Bob approved tests, and then these systems are handled to perfect users who can actually use their brains. But uh, sad news is this is not a perfect world, and it will never be. So this presentation is not for optimists, it's not for pessimists, it's for, let's say, well-informed optimists, for people who know they should create some backups and write logs before shit hits the fan, not after. So we have two processes in, in a world which is not perfect. First is the debugging. Debugging takes place in the program, uh, in the place where we have set the, the breakpoint during the program uh, execution, and we can see pretty much everything. We can evaluate in our IDE pretty much everything that the program has to offer somewhere in, uh, in the memory. Logging in turn is related to log files, console, databases, uh, other kinds of storage. Uh, it always happens post factum and sometimes even post mortem, which means that the system uh, is uh, not available anymore. And we can see only what we have logged, nothing else. We can't ask to provide more data. And Logging can also be remote. This is not a new concept. It was uh, like started in the 1980s with uh, RSS log and send mail and stuff. A few RFCs uh, emerged. And the idea of remote logging is not that we connect to the machine which logs uh, stuff uh, on its own, but the, the machine sets the log sends the log to another machine. And uh, this is the concept of remote logging. So this is nothing new. And uh, one of the ways to intercept logs at the destination machine is to use the Grylog. How can we install Grylog? It's really simple. You can go to the Grylog's download page and for like sophisticated setups for production environments, you can select uh, Tarbos or uh, uh, different orchestration scripts like here and for evaluation purposes or small production environments you can use something up here like uh, virtual machine appliances and uh, for this presentation we'll be using uh, Oracle's uh, VirtualBox manager so you just download single file you double click it the importer runs and you have a configured virtual machine and it should be working uh, the big picture of Grylog. Grylog comes or is distributed as a single fat jar or uber jar. And this jar contains, let's call it for a moment, a core. And this core also has a web client uh, written in React.js. It can accept uh, logs from various sources, uh, so they have a concept of input. Each input can interpret or collect uh, logs sent to that input and understands one format only, so like uh, syslog format. It stores all the data in MongoDB except logs themselves. Logs are sent to Elasticsearch and uh, if you don't know what Elasticsearch is or you don't have that much experience with Elasticsearch, well, uh, not so precise, but satisfactory definition is that it's kind of a NoSQL database, only it's not targeting, like storing documents uh, it's, uh, themselves. It's mainly for indexing and searching through the documents, through the data we uh, send to Elasticsearch. One definition of Elasticsearch is that once you feed it with data, it becomes your own private Google. And of course, we have users who interact with Grylog with this uh, web client written in React.js. Uh, OK, so let's see if we have this uh, Grylog up and working. Sorry, uh, another window. 
Okay, looks like it is, so we log in. We are preparing Grilog for you. The menu. This is a almost fresh virtual machine. And uh, yep, looks like it's loading. We already see here some, uh, I'll try to zoom a little bit. We already see some internal logs. The virtual machine sends its log to Grilog itself uh, just for uh, sake of some samples. Okay, but we don't want to see logs of uh, Grilog uh, itself. We'd like to like attach logs from other devices, like from this computer or our server, operating system, database, uh, various network uh, devices, all kind of stuff, so we can aggregate our logs uh, for further analysis in one place, uh, being Grilog in this case. So uh, let's go to the terminal. I'm using Ubuntu and configuring it to send logs to Grilog is pretty straightforward. Um, oops. Uh, just I can't, oh sorry, not this instance. <laughs> uh, yep, so we edit a file in rsyslog.d. Uh, I'll maybe I'll zoom as well. Um, can you see that? Not my password, hopefully. Okay, and this is the, the single definition, single definition line. So basically, we are telling our syslog, uh, our logger daemon on this Ubuntu machine uh, to log every facility at every level uh, and send UTP, UDP datagrams with logs to this machine, which is the Grilog virtual uh, machine uh, port, and to use this format for sending. We save the file. Uh, and we restart the RSS log daemon and let's log something like log uh, grylog test. Switch to grylog. Let's refresh. Um, yes, and this is the message. Oh, sorry, not this one. Uh, let's let's put it like a test. We can start searching. Okay, this is the message. Uh, we log that to syslog of this machine, and we have sent it to Grilog. So it looks like Grilog is working and uh, accepting uh, our log datagrams. We have more fields in here, like the application name, which is me, when I used logger, uh, that it comes from syslog, when it came, uh, what was the source, and so on and so forth. Um, okay, let's go back to presentation. Simple logging program. After all, we are Java developers or JVM developers here, and we are not to uh, attach or examine logs of our systems that much. We are more after logging uh, logs from our programs written by us. So uh, let's go to, uh, which version is this? Let's go to a simple program. Uh, not this one, this one. Okay, so we have, uh, this is a gradle definition of uh, dependencies. So we have SLF4J. Who's using SLF4J? The rest, shame on you. Really, you should be using SLF4J. It's like an interface for logging and you can, uh, like using SLF4J, declare only the API and the actual logging can be performed by any other library like uh, logback, like uh, JVM logging, uh, log4j and so on and so forth. In this presentation we'll be using logback with some Janina configuration and this will be important later. And we have a very simple program to just produce the logs. So uh, we select a random number and uh, depending on this number in each case we just send some logs and uh, as you can see this can exceed uh, uh, sorry this can exceed from the range this is made on purpose this bug let's say and this then triggers this uh, default which is uh, throwing an exception and let's see the logback definition this is definition of how logback will be uh, logging stuff sending it to uh, to where? This is a good question where will they will be sent. We have defined standard output appender in here with pattern, and we have defined file appender in here also with more sophistic sophisticated pattern. And the root logger is sending logs to standard output appender and file appender. Let's see if that thing is working. Let's give it a spin. Looks like it is. So we have logs locally. And this is the, oh, 
and you see the action code where that's outranged, so the program has stopped. The program is not relevant itself for this presentation that much, only that we have these logs here in our console. They are also sent to the file defined in the file appender. And it's time to try sending these logs to Grylog. So uh, we can add one more dependency, uh, should it be Maven or Gradle, doesn't matter. And one of the options is uh, logstash gelf from uh, Mr. Paluch. And so we have defined it here. And we don't need, by using SLF4J, to change anything in our, uh, in our application. We just add one more appender, which is Gelf appender of this class. We'll be sending logs to this machine over UDP, port, blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. Not that important uh, right now. We can filter uh, the level of the logs which will be sent so we don't pollute our system with uh, trace uh, logs, for instance, and so forth. And here we append the Gelf appender, and let's run the program once more. And again, we see some logs produced to standard output. Let's see if they are also available in Grylog. Uh, just a second. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not used to this. Uh, to this keyboard. Why on earth we can't go there? Like it looks like uh, the browser has hang. Sorry, let's let's start it again then. Uh, Four squids and Google Chrome, and uh, this should be. 68, 4, 30, sorry, 39. Um, and yep, the logs are here. You can see that things weren't out of control, did not warn you, and so on and so forth. These are the logs sent by uh, our simple uh, Java program. And we have more fields to analyze. This is the severity. This, is, this one p in particular was a uh, warning. We know which th thread has sent it, uh, when, what was the facility. And uh, this was the message that got logged. And the source is nastcat, which is another host name for my machine. So as you can see, attaching uh, a another appender to uh, your Java program to send logs to Grylog uh, is rather easy. You just add one more dependency in, a, in logback, you add one more uh, appender, and logs uh, uh, should be flowing. Uh, now I should reopen the presentation. Sorry, uh, this thing. Okay. So we were with this simple logging program. All right. And we can attach also other machines. Uh, thanks to osnet.eu, we have a little router right after this uh, table. And we'll try to capture some logs from this network appliance to just like, you know, get the better picture of what's actually happening in our environment. So let's uh, go to this router management console. Um, to status, system logs, settings, uh, this will, of course, uh, vary between uh, systems, and we tell it to send log messages to uh, remote uh, syslog server, uh, and we enter the IP, which is this, and we are going to send everything, and we're going to click Save, and logs should be flowing now. Let's just make sure there are some logs sent. OK, and let's see in Grylog if the logs have been received. Let's click Enter again and Enter. Oops, logs don't seem to be here. And unfortunately, this is quite a common uh, situation for newbies. 
Uh, this is the first, the biggest, and I say uh, crucial gotcha with uh, with Greylock. Well, not with Greylock itself, but with uh, other different uh, systems. You see, there are a few RFCs, and some of which are outdated. And this little device uh, behind or below this desk is sending UDP log datagrams without uh, time zone. Uh, or it, it can also don't send uh, any timestamp information at all. So this is why we don't see the logs in here. So what we can do, we can s change or shift from rel relative search, which is like five minutes uh, behind now, uh, to absolute and let's select yesterday, let's select tomorrow, let's hit it. And you see some logs, these are filter logs from our little tiny router there. Um, as you can see, the timestamp here is 14 hours, 25 minutes. This seems to be the same uh, timestamp as this, but this Greylock uh, virtual machine by default is running in UTC time zone, which means if it receives uh, logs from this little box, which is running in uh, Warsaw zone, sorry, Krakow, uh, then uh, when there's no time zone information, Grylock will infer that the logs are also sent in UTC. Uh, that's why, from its perspective, the logs are sent from the future. And that's why they are not displayed in relative search uh, display. Uh, you can see that UTC is like uh, two hours uh, behind us. OK, so uh, Let's go back to the presentation. We have attached logs from this machine, from our simple Java program, and from that little router. And log processing, streams. Um, sorry, here you can see uh, logs meshed from different sources, different locations. It's like this machine. Uh, it's like um, the router. It might be kind of uh, difficult to search through them. That's why Greylock has a concept of streams. So stream is like applying a filter on all incoming messages so we can divide th uh, the messages into uh, various streams for easier uh, analysis. Let's create a new stream for this router. Let's call it, let's call it router stream. Okay, also description, router, stream. And we need to add some rules when messages are uh, assigned to this stream. So we select an input, which is uh, syslog, and we add stream rule saying that gl2 remote IP, this is one of the fields which is always present and is remote IP of the sender of the log datagram, um, should match exactly uh, our router's IP, sorry, uh, yeah, like that. Uh, let's try to load the last message. Well, it's from my machine, so okay, let's go to search again. Uh, let's start processing the logs after all. Uh, and again, absolute search because we didn't fix that yet. Yesterday, tomorrow, hit. Okay, so we, let's select this filter log. We can copy ID of this very log message, and we can load it here for testing from Grylog zero index. Lo load this message, and yes, we have the rule that GL2 remote IP must match this very IP, and this message sent from this router uh, will be. Uh, assigned to this stream. So we say, I'm done, and we start this stream. And now when we go to streams and select this router stream, we should see here only logs from this very machine. So this is a very nice and handy and rather simple feature to group logs from yeah, f from whatever you want to, based on whichever uh, conditions you'd like to. It could be a source, it could be a kind of a message, it could be some uh, you know content of the message, whatever. Just you can assign uh, uh, messages and uh, set them in a single stream. Uh, all right, so we have extractors. Let's go back to the default stream and see for these messages. Okay, uh, for these messages, the source has this nasty semicolon at the end. Can you guys see that back in there? Okay. 
All right, so uh, let's open this message. And how can we remove this semicolon? How can we, in general, process the log messages received by logged? Uh, sorry, Grylog. We can create an extractor, and in this very case, we are after replace with regular expression. So we create a regular expression like this, so we capture everything that's uh, before this semicolon, uh, sorry, before this colon, and this is what we're going to replace. Let's try. And this is the input to this extractor. This would be the output. So we got rid of the semicolon. And we store it as the source, sorry, source field. And we create the extractor, OK, like colon source extractor for the title. It's quite noble. Everything has to have a title. Uh, OK, and let's go to all messages. And again, sorry, this absolute search, because we didn't fix that yet. Oh, my. And as you can see, now we have filter log. Uh, we, we got fixed that here. We don't have this uh, colon. And this way, you can process every field, actually. Uh, so he here's the detailed message from uh, firewall which sends that, for instance, this was the source IP, this was the destination IP, and so on and so forth. So we could like extract, we could re regex, we could replace, we could create new fields based on what we received. And this doesn't need any Java hacking. Uh, it's, it's like just point and click in the, in the interface. Um, OK. So back to the presentation, we have pipelines with rules. Pipelines are yet another, and I think very, very powerful mechanism of processing logs. So uh, maybe let's add a pipeline first. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's loading, add a new pipeline. It will become obvious what we are doing. Uh, like uh, timestamp fixing pipeline, because we would like to fix this timestamp uh, which was uh, sent incorrectly. We save that. And now, pipelines consist of stages. Stages have their numbers. The higher the number, the later the stage will be executed. And uh, the feature of stages is that uh, a stage with a lower number can break the whole processing or stop the whole processing of the uh, following stages. So we have, if we have stages one, two, three, four, and stage two says, OK, I'm done with this pipeline, then stages three and four won't be executed. Stages are uh, filled with uh, rules. I have one rule prepared here. Let's see that rule. This is a funny syntax, let's say. We, it basically, a rule consists of three statements. First, we define the rule. Then there's a when clause and then clause. When and, cl and then clause can be empty. When uh, Empty when clause means that this action will be always run. And empty then clause means that, the, uh, that this rule is actually used only for uh, deciding if uh, the further processing at the later stages should take place. Uh, let's analyze this one. So we are going to fix uh, the timestamp, the wrong uh, or the missing timestamp actually from the router. So we say that if the message comes from this IP and we have this IP and we do CIDR match. So this is exactly this IP, but we could also like select that this is a whole subnet or whatever. Then the following steps will be applied. So this is a simple trick. Uh, again, we go to a string processing of data. Um, so we have the format. Note, please note that it has no time zone information here. So we load the recorded date from this object, which is message timestamp. We then format this date using this format without time zone to formatted date. This is a string, obviously. And then we pass this date again uh, from this formatted date only using this format. And now we know that this is Europe Warsaw, not Euro Krakow. Europe Krakow, sorry. And so we are redoing the step uh, of uh, which was done initially. And this also shows that we can pretty much do everything. Let me zoom out. And here you have a quite nice collection of functions you can use. You see it's a few pages long. And uh, you can also define your own functions if the default ones uh, are not OK for you. OK, so we have this rule. 
Uh, one more thing, this pipeline isn't working because we didn't uh, attach it to any stream, so let's attach it to the default stream. Let's save it. OK, and let's create some messages. Uh, as you can see here, we have the through output. We can also trace the through output here. This is the general through output of the messages in Grilog. This is a through output of uh, throughput, sorry, of uh, this very uh, pipeline. Okay, so let's go back to searching. Now we have this relative search, and see we have this timestamp fixed. This shows how pipelines and rules are, are powerful when it comes to pre-processing or processing logs. And please note, we didn't write a single line of Java code yet. We just did everything in the interface of Grilog. Uh, so we have fixed the source field, and we, can, we have fixed this uh, timestamp uh, field. OK, uh, this is the rule just for the record. Logging from many instances. Previously, we had this simple uh, program, which was like a uh, you know, Hello World program running a single core locally at a machine. But in the uh, real world, you have your web applications, or maybe not web applications, but these are like you know, these fancy microservice-ish applications. They are deployed somewhere out there in the cloud. You have many instances to handle picks, to handle load, and so on and so forth. And the idea is to capture logs of all these instances, of all these programs, and send them to a central place when they can be stored, analyzed, searched, and so on and so forth. So uh, we have yet another, uh, let's close this one maybe, or switch. We have yet another program. This is a simple servlet program, nothing fancy in here, really. So we'll be using Glassfish. Uh, and again, we use SLF4J with logback and the, 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 append the appender we already know. Uh, Hello Server does nothing fancy uh, besides saying, uh, inviting you to introduce yourself and saying uh, how are you in various languages. And occasionally it can also break. Chances are here are also artificial, like 1 to 10, then we log uh, an error. Uh, let's go to logback definition, because this time we have introduced MDC. Do you know what MDC is? It's it's basically, uh, it's mapped dictionary context, if I remember correctly. Uh, uh, sorry, mapped diagnostic context. What it is, it is uh, like a map, which is stored uh, per thread, so it's thread local, and you can put various things in there, so these things are then later accessible in the logs, uh, in the log statements in, in this pattern. As you can see, we have a filter here, which extracts username from, from the cookie. And in MDC, we put this username. We just got extracted or unknown if we don't know. We put the ins also the instance of the system which is running here. And this uh, can get locked uh, here in this MDC username. And in Jelf appendof, Appender, we can also include them. We, we have here the statement include for MDC. And for the root logger, we have, as previously, standard file and Gelf appenders. OK, so uh, maybe let's give it a spin and see how it works. So let's start all instances for Lion Tiger, Jaguar and Lynx. OK, everything's up. So this is to mimic your multi-instance cloudish microservices uh, environment. Uh, let's go to this application. Nice, nice cat because cats should be nice, shouldn't they? OK, and this is it. Hello, stranger. Why don't you introduce it yourself? And as we refresh, you see that this is oh, an error occurred, uh, that this is a round robin load balancer. So every request that hits our load balancer redirects this request to another instance. And this time, this time we, are, uh, we were hosted by uh, Jaguar. Um, so this is just only for demonstration purposes. And uh, errors are also for uh, demonstration purposes. Every given number of, uh, uh, of uh, requests, we are going to send 500 just to uh, see how this can be handled by Grilog. OK, so let me introduce myself. 
And okay, an error, planned error, and we have done this. Okay. Uh, let's, sorry, not this window, this window. Uh, so we have sent the logs, or so it seems. Let's see if they are in Crylog now. Uh, yes, they are. Again, uh, salute Piotr uh, and so on and so forth. How do you, uh, we can now just if you'd like to see these messages coming instantly, constantly, you can click this little button, select a period, and then uh, logs should be flowing. Let's create some more, uh, some more requests. Uh, to get more logs, um, and okay, uh, so let's let's check the logs from uh, from NiceCat only to ignore the others for the moment. So we can select like source NiceCat, and we have only messages from NiceCat, and this is like. Uh, we don't get much from this display, right? So we might uh, wish to have more fields displayed in here, so we don't have to like click and examine uh, uh, each and every field of this uh, message. So we can uh, have like uh, user agent, uh, we can have response code, we can have severity, we can have whatever you'd like to have. We can have the username, and now uh, you can see that this, th these are the messages logged from Cyril. So it didn't log in, so the user is unknown. Uh, so we can select another uh, user, let's say, and, and this is important. Ands and ors need to be in uppercase, otherwise they won't work. And user name, let's say, Okay, so these are the messages uh, sent by me. As you can see, I was using Chrome. Uh, let's disable that. And let's see for the nasty errors we had. So, and response code equal 500. And we had just one so far. So let's hope to go oh, the second, third. Let's get some more errors. Okay, let's refresh it now. Okay, and we have more errors. When you click it, you can also get uh, uh, normally if if you throw an exception, we didn't in this case. You get the stack trace in here, which maybe we could see uh, for Corrup uh, for that previous simple program. You can also see thread here. You can see the facility. This comes from uh, this very definition that we had defined facility in our uh, Greylock appender. And the instance was uh, Lion. So this very error was logged at Lion instance for user Piotr. Okay, uh, so show surrounding messages to see what this user has been doing uh, a bit ahead and a bit after. And you get a nice history. Let me just select instance here. And even with this round robin, you can track uh, the all actions of the user, like this user issued this statement at this uh, instance uh, at this time. This was, this was the log message. This was the response code. So you see, this is what we can get from Grylog, which is not possible if we ask for individual logs of each and every instance, because we would need to like traditionally go to distance A, B, C, uh, download or SCP logs, then grab them, then analyze, and so on and so forth. Here with Grylog, we have uh, all logs from all instances for the same user, uh, nicely shown in, uh, in a history. So this allows uh, further analysis uh, when somebody calls you, hurry, hurry, I need some help because uh, your system uh, doesn't work. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Searching, I just have shown you a bit of searching, I think. So this is using uh, Lucene format. You can search pretty much everything. You can search for missing fields. You can search uh, you know, you know, with various ors and rs and so on and so forth. Alerts. So we have streams, we have this main stream, but you're not going to sit and stir if an error occurred, right? So you, you want to be alerted by the system when something bad happens. So you go to alerts and we can define an alert. 
uh, an alert is triggered or raised uh, when uh, some conditions are met. So let's add a new condition, select stream, let it be the default one, and when the field content uh, matches. OK, add this condition, like internal server error in field resource code. This is one of the MDC uh, fields. Uh, we have added in uh, logback, and when it equals 500, right? So for grace period, message back like three minutes. Let's save it, and I won't add uh, notifications here because we're offline. But uh, it, when an alert is raised, you can d define various notifications. You can get mailed, or Greylock can uh, trigger HTTP requests, so it can send you a tweet or whatever. Uh, just uh, you know, so uh, you see something wrong is happening uh, when you're having your lunch, for instance. Uh, okay, so we have alerts covered. Dashboards. Sometimes you may wish to see what the system is doing in general, let's say, in the last 24 hours. And by default, Greylock comes with a very nice dashboard of Nginx uh, it's using in this virtual machine. Let's take a look at this uh, dashboard. As you can see, in the last 24 hours, we had 38 requests of which zero were 400s and zero were 500s. Uh, HTTP versions were distributed like totally to HTTP 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1 sorry. Uh, these are also the response codes. We only had uh, all successes. Uh, and th here on these charts, you can get distributions. Here you can see me testing that virtual machine yesterday night. And here are the requests we just uh, made. So we can see peaks, you can see lo uh, the load uh, of, of, uh, of your system, Nginx, in, in this very example. Uh, you don't need any, any other, uh, let's say, analysis tool to, to verify this. OK, let's go to even a bigger picture. So uh, Greylock, as you have seen, has a concept of many inputs. We had inputs uh, from syslog. We had inputs from Greylock extended login format. If the syslog is not enough for you because you can't fit all the data, track traces, and so on uh, in the syslog format, then it can uh, actually integrate with the rest of your company's stuff. How is it done? Actually, uh, the client of, uh, of uh, Grylock is an uh, application that communicates with Grylock server. This big red circle in the middle is a REST server. So the um, client communicates over REST API. So can we also in with other systems. Uh, let's go like. Let's send a REST query to the to, to this server instance, and you can see we got a, we got an answer, and this is the proof that it's running in 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 UTC time zone. And you can uh, send every, everything that a client does. You can also do uh, via REST API because this is how the client actually communicates uh, with the server. Okay. Uh, you don't have single Mongo instance. You can have and should have a whole MongoDB replica set. And you ca should also have the whole uh, cluster or, or, or shards or whatever it's called of, of Elasticsearch, uh, many instances just to you know, uh, better handle the load, the picks of logs from your uh, systems. And guess what? Greylock also can spawn very uh, many nodes. So actually, uh, and of course, more inputs. So that makes this system actually distributed and cloudish uh, as well, because you can have many instances of, uh, and you should have many instances of, of Elasticsearch, MongoDB, and maybe even Grylock itself if you need more performance. Uh, but it's better to start by adding some RAM. Usually it has better effects than uh, another instances of Greylock. It's better to fit the instance you already have with more RAM uh, than uh, start another process. Okay, some internal stuff, because it may also be important if you'd like to take a look at it uh, as a developer. Uh, Greylock comes with Swagger. What Swagger is, let's go to uh, to Grylock. Okay, let's go to system, nodes. 
we have only one node of Grylog in this machine, and this is Swagger is for dynamic interactive REST API browser. So if you don't know what you should send to the server to get some data or to you know create some log definitions, you can just use Swagger. Okay, and let's see if we had any alerts since we created. Nope, there were none. This is, so you can like you know create a, even a cron script to feed uh, your Zabbix or whatever monitoring system uh, uh, you happen to have, and uh, like or mail it or whatever. You can just do with Grylock everything via a REST API, uh, and Swagger is for showing you what you can get from from Grylock. Okay. Um, you don't have to deploy Grylog. It has a server included. Uh, it's running using Grizzly and Jersey, so the REST API and the client are hosted uh, from the server, which is embedded in this uh, single uh, fat jar file. It uses Apache Shiro for um, authentication and authorization, which means you can have not only users and roles, but you can also fine grain what the roles can do or even what the users can do, although this is a bit uh, odd and deprecated. It's better to like, you know, have a very precise definition of roles using the permissions and then uh, assign the roles to the users. Uh, it also ha uses Airlift. Airlift is a library which, which allows you to create very nice command line uh, interfaces, which means you can use this uh, single fat jar and use it like uh, Git in your, in your terminal to get some stuff uh, displayed or, or done. Uh, it uses React.js for, uh, for the client and Juice. Uh, sorry, Josh. It looks like you can create a decent software without Spring. And they're using multi bindings uh, from Juice, which allows you to have some plugins from Marketplace. Uh, if you need some plugins, and usually you do, to process like uh, some other data from uh, other sources, you can just download a plugin. Uh, put it into a directory uh, in, in Grylog uh, machine, re restart Grylog itself, and the plugin will work. It will be picked up. Uh, of course, if there's no plugin, you can also write uh, yourself uh, something. Uh, there are documents, very nice how to do that. Uh, they have context, content packs, uh, so you can like copy and paste extractors, what we have done for this uh, colon extractor. And they have a uh, GURF libraries. We were using one uh, log appender using this uh, GURF uh, library for Java, but you, can, but you have uh, GURF libraries also for other languages. So we can log like Windows, you can log C Sharp, uh, Python, JavaScript, uh, whatever. If there is no, like let's say, proper Appender, you can get a GURF library, wire it, and then you can start um, sending logs from any virtually, I think, any system, any server, any database, any program you manage to write. It just this is to you know make it send uh, messages which can be understood by Grylog. Okay, that would be all. Do you have any questions? There are some. Have you been running Greylog in production? And if so, for how long? And what's the load, the regular load that you're getting? Uh, we are going to run it in production. So far, our tests uh, um, proven that it's uh, behaving quite nicely, uh, but mainly not to log it because uh, recently I'm not that much Java developer. I'm more to handle that little devices, and we are to collect uh, to collect logs from uh, many devices. And uh, well. I, I can't tell you, uh, we, we, we had some experiments with performance, if that's what you're asking for. And uh, at Grylog uh, webpage, you can find a uh, calculator, so you like uh, put what the load you expect to have, and it will like uh, create some hints for you that you should have that many instances of Grylog, MongoDB, and Elasticsearch. But this is not like that, you know, uh, wisdom given from, from heaven. Uh, this kinds of systems and I have some experience also with other DevOps, are always 
um, are always prone to some testing. You need to really perform some stress testing in your pre-prod environment to find what really suits you. And one advice from me, uh, if something shows you that it's like occupied 50% and 60%, try to see if it g can go to 100%, because sometimes the 60% is actually 100%. It's it's all that you can get from this from this system. So uh, what I can say, just to summarize this answer, there's no better answer just to get to this calculator, start with that output, and then uh, just you know test test it on your own. Each setup is different. Sorry, it's no no silver bullet here. What what are the key differences between ALOC and the gray lock? Because they seem quite similar. Sorry, be, between what and gray lock? Uh, elastic lock stash. Uh, I mean lock stash. Uh, well, we were considering both, and we have decided to go with gray lock. Uh, one is the license. Uh, gray lock is uh, GPL uh, license. Another thing is that um, is the UI. And in general purpose, like for Logstash, uh, uh, you should use Kibana, if I'm not uh, wrong, which is like a Swiss Army general purpose tool, whereas uh, the client uh, in, in Grylog is uh, designed and written from the very first line to the last line only to support uh, handling logs. So Grylog is targeted exclusively uh, for handling logs, whereas uh, Logstash is uh, Logstash will help you with that, but it has no targeted UI. Yeah, how to secure communication between Appender and uh, Greylock endpoint? Um, it should be sent over secure channels, if that's what you mean. I mean, uh, it's more a question about your network setup, like uh, secured VPNs uh, and so on, so nobody can sniff on your uh, UDP log datagrams, I think. Like, there is no, you, can, you can't like encrypt them at one end and decrypt them at the other. You just need a secure channel. Uh, can you clear? create alerts on absence of uh, some message? Uh, Usually you uh, can have alert on errors. Um, but let's, let's see if that's possible. Um, it should be possible, I think. Manage conditions, add new condition, uh, all messages and condition tape. Message count alert condition. Yeah, that is it. So if in a time range you get zero con uh, messages of certain kind, this can trigger uh, an alert. Like you expect something to be up and running and sending messages, and there are none actually. Anything else? The code is also available uh, at GitHub if you fancy to uh, give it a spin on your own and, and see how it behaves with, with Greylog. Uh, it's really simple to start. Uh, just remember that the device or system may send logs with uh, missing time zone or no time step at all, and then we will, you won't see it in default search parameters. It's like 80% of cases where people say, Greylog isn't working for me. Okay, looks like we are uh, getting to the end. Thank you very much then, and enjoy the conference. Okay, you will have to ask. <laughs>